Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to talk something, or I'm going to talk about something uh, tonight in the introduction uh, that I am really passionate about. I probably will never do it, but I am extremely passionate about it. My wife isn't in here tonight. She would be in the back of the auditorium or wherever she would be sitting, just shaking her head the whole time as I talk about uh, this topic. Um, but like I said, I am truly passionate about it. I've done a ton of research. Um, I figured out all the numbers. I know exactly where I would go and what I would do. I got it all figured out. But like I said, I'm probably never going to do it because my wife won't let me do it. Um, but uh, it's uh, pretty exciting to me. So we're going to talk about it this evening. And then, uh, like I said at the beginning, something that the Lord's been working on my life through. Uh, and we'll see what the Lord has for us this evening. So Philippians chapter 2. So we probably heard this saying before, uh, do what makes you happy. Do whatever makes you happy. It's a movement that's been happening now for a few years, and you've probably seen these on TV or something like that, or seen them in a magazine. Who, who's ever seen like the tiny homes? Anybody ever seen the tiny homes? I am all about tiny homes. Uh, I've talked to Mr. Koblitz about it, and we've laughed about it. I've done, like I said, extensive research. I figured out all the numbers. I figured out what I would buy, I figured out how I would move it, I figured out where I would put it. I would buy 30 acres somewhere and plop it right in the middle where nobody can bother me and that's where I would stay the rest of my life. 300 square feet would be all I need. One, you know, like bathroom that just, who knows where it goes for some of these. It normally just stays there for the most part. But I got it all figured out and it would be epic. And the thought process is like simplify your life. Get rid of everything that you don't need. You know, get rid of your debt, get rid of all these things that don't make you happy. Uh, minimalize your life to have only the things that you need to survive with or that make you happy or whatever it is. That's the thought process. It is. I'm doing all these rich research for whatever reason. I still don't know why I got into it, but I'm into it. Um, and doing all these research. At the end of every article, at the end of every blog, or at the end of every video, the biggest thing that everybody says is just do whatever makes you happy. So we, we live in a society and we live in a world that's concerned, as we are most of the time in our lives, if we're honest, with what makes us happy. We all in this room want to make sure that we are taken care of. That I don't have any worries, concerns, doubts, guilt, or whatever. I want to make sure that I am okay. And it's not only in that lifestyle, but in any kind of lifestyle, that is the thought process or the mindset. What is going to make me happy? Or what is going to bring me peace or joy or whatever? What is it going to bring to me? And the concern always in our lives is, is ourselves, not anybody else. Always ourselves. But we're given examples here as we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. An example of our Savior Jesus Christ. I will mention this a couple times tonight. I was taught this as a freshman in college by one of my Bible teachers, and he said this, first day of class, it was uh, Christ in the Old Testament was the class that I was taking, and he started out with this. If you're willing in your life every single morning when you get up to think about what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you, it will change the way you live your life that day. That's so true. If I'm willing every single morning to wake up when I wake up, before I go in my routine, before I do whatever I want to do that day or have to do that day, and if I'm willing to spend some time and think about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross for me, as a child of God, I have to live my life differently that day. We would say if I or anybody of us in this room actually did that, and then went on and lived our lives that day for ourselves or did things that we know we shouldn't be doing or right away watched something on TV that I shouldn't watch or did something that I know I shouldn't do, we'd be like, what are you doing? You just spend time thinking about what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. What's going on? But yet, if we're honest, it's so easy for us just to get in that mindset. Me today. Make me happy today. Do what brings me joy today. Make sure that I'm taken care of today. And it's a struggle for all of us. It's a struggle for me. The proposition that I have for you tonight is either my plan or Christ's plan. Instead of the simple life, which is a big movement nowadays when it comes to this kind of mindset, I want to talk about tonight the humble life. Are we willing to humble ourselves and give everything over to Christ? 
everything. Not just the easy things, not just the things that are easy to give over to him, but everything, truly everything. And we know when we're willing to do that, it has a genuine effect on our lives that is evident to those around us. Every time we do it, it's going to be evident. Because as a child of God, when I'm willing to give everything over to God, then my life, my concerns, my thoughts, what I want to accomplish, what I want to do is not the main concern anymore. It's Christ, what do you want, to, what do you want me to do today? What do you want from my life today? My concern or my thought process is not inward, but it's upward and then outward. And we're going to see the example that Paul gives us here in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse number 1. And we'll read through verse number 11. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Let this, let, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus." Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear Lord, I ask that you be with us this evening. I ask, Lord, that you fill me, Lord, with your power. Give me your strength, your wisdom. Just guide me tonight, Lord. Guide me in the direction, Lord, that I should go. I, I know you've put this message, Lord, on my heart, and it's been something, as I mentioned earlier, Lord, that you've been working in my life. I ask, Lord, that with your Spirit's help, I do and say exactly what you want from me, Lord, tonight. May our hearts, Lord, as a congregation, be open to your testimony and your example here tonight. May you show us, Lord, things in our lives where we might be just self-centered or self-focused and not focus on the things, Lord, that you want us to be. I pray, Lord, that you bless this time, bless this evening, Lord, and I pray all this in your name. Amen. Paul is transitioning from Philippians chapter 1 about talking about his imprisonment. He's talking about him being in prison and how he would rather be with Christ, but he knows that for him to stay on earth is what's going to be profitable for the Philippians. And he transitioned here and he starts to mention a couple things. As we read this passage, what an amazing example is given to us by Christ in these verses. Paul turns, like I said, from his imprisonment to how the Philippians should live and calls them to follow Christ's example. I want to look at three aspects this evening from this passage that have been challenging in my life. Number one here, quickly this evening, I want to see the encouragement that Paul gives us in the first couple of verses there of Philippians chapter 2. In verse number two, he says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Paul is encouraging the church of Philippi to be unified. He's talking about all the things that have been happening in his life with the imprisonment and all the things that he's been going through. And he knows what's happening at the church of Philippi. Uh, Philippi was a very Roman city, like super patriotic. They were all about the Roman Empire. They were all about Caesar. And that's the place where this, this church is at. And Paul's encouraging them, hey, be together. Because he understands, as we all understand, that it's easy for us to be set apart. Even as children of God. There's things that separate us all the time. For whatever the reason. Silly stuff. Like, I'm a Dodgers fan. That separates some of us. Like, boo Dodgers, we're a Tigers fan. You guys don't win, so I'm a Dodgers fan. Okay? So, but that could separate some of us. 
It really can. As silly as it is, be like, no, you like the Dodgers, I like the Tigers, we cannot be friends. Silly. Especially when you're looking at what Jesus Christ did in these following verses. Jesus Christ just paid the ultimate sacrifice for all of us, and he's challenging the church of Philippi, hey, be unified. Be like-minded. Be of one accord. Think about the things that separate us. Think about the things that drive us nut about, nuts about each other. I'm going to say this about my wife because she's not in here. So she can't give me a hard time. Okay? But we were married for a couple years. And she was drinking a glass of water. And for whatever reason, if you've been in our Sunday school class, you've heard this story before. For whatever reason, I thought she was going to die. It was the loudest swallow I've ever heard in my life. And I was like, what's going on? Are you okay? She's like, I'm fine. I'm just drinking water. And then ever since that day, I cannot get it out of my head. It is the loudest thing that you could ever hear. Now, I know some of you, if you know really well, you're hanging, now you're going to be paying attention for it and looking for it. Okay, so she's going to beat me up when I get home. Okay, but certain things like that, like, I'm like, what is going on? Like, what is happening? I've never heard this before. I think we were like three years or four years into our marriage. So like, I never heard this before. What is happening? Like, this could have just blown it all up. I would have never married you if I knew this was happening. You know, not true. Okay. Um, but even like things like that, like I've known in marriages, some things very like silly things, if you were really think about it, that just blow marriages up. And yet things in the church, same exact things, blow things up like that. But yet we're being challenged by Paul to be unified. Christ brought us together, so let's stay together. Don't let the things that are going on in this world, especially nowadays, separate us by any means. We are supposed to be unified in Christ. And he's challenging the church at Philippi to be the same. Verse number two, read it one more time. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Secondly, he says here, and he's trying to encourage the church of Philippi, don't be selfish. And how easy that is. Verse number three, the first part of it says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. What are you doing and who are you doing it for? It's so easy for us to just be focused on ourselves, even when we know that shouldn't be our mindset. Well, nobody understands what I'm going through. Probably true, but Christ does. Nobody at church cares about what I'm going through. Could be true, but Christ knows. You don't know how hard my life is. I probably don't, but Christ does. But yet what happens sometimes, as happened in my life, as the Lord was showing me, when I focus on myself, I miss out on what the Lord has for me. I might miss out on an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody else and take the focus off myself. But because I'm so focused on myself, I miss that opportunity. I'm the principal here at the school, and it's challenging sometimes because sometimes with teenagers, you can tell sometimes how they're just focused on themselves. I mean, if we're honest, when we were teenagers, and even if we're honest now, we're still self-centered sometimes. But teenagers, for whatever reason, can be that way. I was that way. Okay? I play sports. I'll be the one who says I was that way. I play sports, and when I play sports, it was all about me. I was not good at sports. Okay? I did okay, I guess. I was not good at sports, but... Um, playing football, football where I grew up there in California was a big deal. And when you were scored a touchdown, at our school, you weren't allowed to celebrate. That was the rule. Our AD was a pretty big guy. His name was Danny Coates. He was a really, really big guy. He was a scary guy. And his rule, and he told all the kids, we had a meeting with the athletic director before any of the sports seasons, and he would go through the sports handbook and how players should conduct themselves, what we should do, how we should behave, what our grade point average should be. He should go over everything. And the last thing every year was do not celebrate during football season, basketball season, volleyball season, anything. Okay? Focus on your team. That's how they always ended it. Well, okay, as a teenager, right, you're in this battle, especially when it comes to football. You're getting hit. You're getting thrown around. I am not thinking about what Brother Coates said in this meeting. I'm thinking about winning the game. Do whatever it takes to win the game. So you score a touchdown, and you have all this adrenaline in you. Oh, something's going to happen. 
Because the focus is, look at what I did. Look at what just I, look at what I just accomplished. I just ran through all these people and scored a touchdown. Look at me. And we see that in the world today. We see that especially with social media today. The focus has to be me. So I'm going to post about my life. I'm going to share things to make sure that people like it and I get a thumbs up because it makes me feel better. That's the inside that we're looking at all the time. But we're surrounded in a world that wants to make sure that you are okay. Do whatever makes you happy. But yet we're challenged not to be that way. If we're honest, we're thankful that our Savior Jesus Christ was not that way. We'll see here in a minute. Letters, uh, number three here under the encouragement that Paul had. He's challenging them not to be selfish, but to be selfless. Second part of verse number three into verse number four. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. My dad always challenges this way. Um, I never thought we didn't have anything growing up. My dad and my mom did a great job of that, and I really appreciate them for them. I tell them that all the time. But my dad always challenged us during Christmas time, especially just to make sure that we were thinking about other people. Um, we were blessed to have gifts. Uh, and where I grew up, in the place that I grew up, not everybody was that way. So he would challenge us to think about others. One of the things growing up that he would tell us every once in a while was, give one of your gifts away. He would tell us that. I was telling this story uh, to last year to our SOS kids in chapel. And one of the students came up to me, and it was a genuine question. He's like, did you give the best one away? Not always. <laughs> Probably should have, but not always. But I love my, the, the thought process my dad had. It's, hey, you've been blessed. Others probably aren't as blessed as you are. Think about them. Be willing to give one of your gifts away. Now, with some of the gifts that I gave away, I had no idea what happened to them. You know, as most kids, they probably broke it a week later like most kids do with their Christmas presents anyway. But there was one thing that really meant a lot to me one year. I was nine years old and I got a basketball. It, like, changed my life forever. I got a basketball and I was super excited about it. It was a genuine leather basketball. And again, my dad, after we opened all the presents, he's like, hey, make sure that you're thinking about other people. Think about somebody that you can give a gift away to. There was a kid that I knew in my Sunday school class. His name was Doug. He was a bus kid. His family started coming to church through the bus route there at Lancaster. And the Lord put him on my heart. And the Lord put on my heart to give him my basketball. I mean, this was my basketball. Been looking forward to this. I had a hoop outside, even though it was like on gravel, but we could still play on it. And I was looking forward to using it. But I did what the Lord wanted me to do. I gave it away. Now again, I, do, I wasn't thinking about it, never thought about it again. I gave my basketball away. And that's all I can think of. He, the kid, student Doug, came to our school at Lancaster Baptist School. Got to be friends with him, grew up with him for a little while. When I was a ninth grader, he told me the story about when a kid gave him a basketball from church. And how his parents were so excited that somebody would sacrifice something that they loved, and they kept coming to church. They grew in church, they got involved, they stayed there for a while. I had no idea. No idea. But it was like, you look back at it, and it's like, look what the Lord can do. Even with the selfish kid that wanted to keep it. But when we're willing not to think of ourselves, the Lord can do something amazing. But it's so easy for us just to focus on ourselves. Look at what they have. Look at what they, they are able to do. Look at where they are able to go. Look at what they can accomplish. Look at what they can do. Quit. Why? We spend so much energy on that. And we spend so much of our time on that. But we're taught, not only in this passage, but in throughout the Bible, focus on others. Because that's what Christ did. He did what He did on the cross for all of us. 
And he wasn't focused on himself. He was focused on every single one of us. So can we, as Paul is encouraging the church of Philippi, not be selfish, but be selfless? Think about who you can be a blessing or encouragement to. Ask the Lord when you get up every morning, who can I help today? Bring somebody across my path who I can be an encouragement or blessing to. Even in the time that we're in today, as crazy as it is, we, cannot, we can do better at not thinking about ourselves and what we're going through, but think about other people. Number two here, we're going to look at the example of Christ. Paul draws all these ideas together around Jesus' crucifixion. It is the turning point that shows how far Jesus was willing to go to serve his people. So he tells us not to think about ourselves, but to think about others, to have that focus. And he goes right into this like messianic poem about Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And he mentions some things throughout this passage, and it's a familiar passage. Jesus' life plotted the path for the return journey that all of us can take. And this is what it is. Give yourself away to be found in God. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. Die to yourself in order to find your true life. So starting in verse number six, first we're going to see Jesus's glory. Verse number six says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So Jesus Christ was with God. Verse number seven, we see Jesus's service, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. We see in verse number eight, Jesus humility and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Verse number eight, the second part there, we see Jesus' death and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We see next Jesus' exaltation. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Verse number 10, we see where all humanity will bow down to Jesus. Verse number 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And we see lastly in verse 11, that he gives glory to God. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have an example given here of when we're willing to give of ourselves what God does in return. If we're willing to humble ourselves and not think about ourselves, but we're willing to sacrifice of ourselves, Jesus Christ will, or God will exalt us. He will take care of it. That's what we should be seeking after. God to be glorified, not myself, not the things that I want to pursue, but be willing to sacrifice of myself to see what God can do. But yet, as we've been saying, our focus is ourselves and everything that's going on in our lives. You have to ask ourselves the same way that the Lord challenged me, why? Why is my focus always me? Why is my focus always what I want? Why can I not think of other people? Why can I not focus on others? Why can I not think of other people's needs first? Why always mine? I go back to, like I said at the beginning, if I'm willing to get up every morning and think about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for me on the cross, I have to live my life differently. Be willing to do it. Be willing to get up and genuinely think about that sacrifice and everything that he went through. For you. For me. Think about it. It was not an easy one. He wasn't like, yeah, this is going to be fun. No, it wasn't. But he did it for the, his love for every single one of us. 
But yet it's so easy for us every single day and easy for me to get up and focus on me. Forget the other people. They don't know what I have to do today. They don't know what I have to go through. I deal with teenagers every single day and a whole lot of emotions. And some of it is funny. But every single day, girls, boys, boys who behave like girls and are very emotional, that's always fun. Every day. But yet I'm supposed to be genuinely caring, right? I had a, a kid come into the office and he was crying, trying to figure out why he was crying. And it's because a boy took a ball away and he wouldn't stop crying. It's just a ball. But it meant everything to him. That ball meant everything to him. And you can tell by the screams. So I could have sat there as a principal, right? Been like, quit crying, suck it up, get it over with, just go play. Now, because of my dad and the way he raised me, I'm a lot more like sympathetic, I guess. I'm a lot more kind. So I sat there and talked with the kid. It's all right, man. It's just a ball, let it go. There's other balls you can play with, and there was. You could play a different game. Do you want me to play a game with you? Yeah. All right, well, I just got myself into something. Okay, so let's go outside. And I played a game with him, five minutes. But it changed his day. And then we worked on the attitude for a little bit as we were walking outside. All right, if somebody takes the ball away, it's not something to cry over. We're not supposed to have a bad attitude. We're supposed to be pleasing God with our attitudes. We're having that conversation as we're walking out. He's like, yes, sir, I know. I know what I should be doing. I just got a little overwhelmed and I got worked up. But then spending that time with that, not thinking about myself, trust me, because I could be, I have better things to do than to walk out with this kid, spend some time with him. But honestly, I don't. I don't. That was worth it. For that kid and for me. I have to be willing to humble myself every day. All of us do. But what it really comes back to is, are we willing to? Are we willing to humble ourselves and say, not me, but others? Not me, but my savior. Are we willing to do that? We have an example in Christ. He was willing to. And as we sang earlier, we have the victory because of what he did. Don't forget that. Let it impact your life. We know it should. It should impact our lives. It should change our lives. But does it? Does it? Lastly here, I want to share just some expectations. These are more personal expectations that I've seen in my life. Not that I've been at this a long time. The Lord's taking me a different direction this evening when it came to this. But here are just some thought process and some things that I've seen that I hope are encouragement to you. When our focus is Christ, others will be impacted. When our focus is Christ, others will be impacted. It's awesome to see what the Lord can do when I don't put myself first. I think all of us in this room, if we're honest, will say, yeah, I've seen that. I've seen when I don't put myself first and see the need of somebody else and help them meet that need, it feels so much better. Like it's not like a trick here, like it's not a trick question or it's not like a tr trick or whatever. It's true. When we put other people first and we help meet other people's needs, you feel better. It's not like my great dream of going out into the middle of the woods with 30 acres and having a tiny home and forgetting everybody. No. It's helping other people because of things that the Lord's put on my heart through His Spirit's guidance and let's see what the Lord can do. But sometimes we get in this like just mindset of, man, I am exhausted today. It was a long day. I get it. I've been there. So I don't want to help anybody else. Everybody should be helping me. I just had a long day. But that can't be our mindset. Because who knows what we miss out on. 
I know that if I never would have gave that basketball away in hindsight, I don't know if that family would have kept coming to church. I have no idea. Maybe they would have, maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. But I know that had an impact. It changed the kid's life. A ball. Not that big of a deal. But it impacted his life. And I can give you countless examples of people who sacrifice them themselves for me. I can tell you about Sunday school teachers. I can tell you about youth pastors. I can tell you about family members. I can tell you about church family members. I can tell stories of some of you. You guys are an awesome church family who sacrifice so much for us when we really don't deserve it sometimes. But you guys are just that generous and just that loving and just that kind. But it shouldn't just be in this room. It should go out of this place as well. May this world see a church family that is an example of a Christ is. We'll have an impact. We'll make a change. What stands out to me is verse number 15 here in Philippians chapter 2. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Do you? Do you shine as a light in this world? I wake up every morning and I ask the Lord for help every single day because I have to go try to impact the next generation of kids. I was taught in college all the time, whether this is true or not, I don't know, but they taught us all the time that we're one, Christianity is one generation away from just going extinct. Right, we're taught, we, I was taught that all the time. So to me, having impact on the next generation, teaching them every day, being around them every day, I need God's help. Because as teenagers, if we're being honest and we're willing to think back when we were teenagers, we know sometimes when somebody said something that threw us off maybe of the direction that we should go. A teacher was mean. A teacher said, you're, a gonna, you're gonna amount to nothing. You're not gonna accomplish anything in your life. And for a teenager, we'll rub it off, right? We'll be like, oh, whatever. She doesn't know what she's talking about. He doesn't know. But that has an effect. Oh, no doubt. We've, I've been with students, and you heard the stories about pe people picking on other people and teenagers bullying other teenagers. That has an impact. But all of those things happen when those people, when us, are focused on ourselves. If I'm focused on Christ... I'm not going to tell a teenager, you're going to amount to nothing. Because I know that Christ knows that that teenager is important. That teenager is valuable. But when I'm self-centered, focused, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to be thinking about that. I'm going to be thinking about this teenager who didn't do their homework, who's trying to make up an excuse and try to get away with it. Like all of us did, if we're honest, at one point or another. And be like, did you... If this is going to be your attitude, you're not going to accomplish anything. Get out of my class. That's not an example of Christ. But yet at work, at home, is that our attitude? Is that our mindset? Ourselves and not others? Is it challenging? Yeah. Not always easy. But, like I said at the beginning, if you're willing to focus on Christ when you get up every morning and think about the sacrifice that he made for you, it's going to change the way you live your life that day. It has to. It has to. I can't go about that day thinking about myself. It's an amazing sacrifice. It's a life-changing sacrifice. And we're willing to admit it. So let it change your life. May all of us go out from here wanting to be that light that shines in this world. Because we're supposed to be. Because of what Christ did for all of us in this room. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for that amazing sacrifice. It's so true, Lord, how it's so easy for us just to focus on ourselves to focus on maybe the problems that we have or the things that we're going through. But we're challenged here not to be. 
but to be focused on you and to be focused on others. I ask, Lord, that you help us with that. We need your help. For us, Lord, not to be focused on ourselves, we need your help. But it starts with us, Lord, all of us, myself included in this room tonight, Lord, being willing to say, my focus, Lord, is going to be you. And it's going to be others and not me. It's easy to turn the focus or the light on us, but we're challenged, Lord, to turn the light on you. To make sure that this world sees us in you. As the music begins to play, if that's you, if you need to say, you know what, that's me. I've been self-focused. I have not been focused on others maybe the way that I should. The Lord is showing me things in my life that I'm focused on and it's not Him. By raising your hand, you would say, you know what, Pastor Galdemez, that's me. I've been focused on myself. I've not been focused on others. It's been all about me. If you need to come forward and share that with the Lord, I encourage you to now. The Lord will help you. He's the only one that can. He's the only one that can help us. But we have to be willing to ask for help. Pray, Lord, that we do our best to remind ourselves of it every single day and may it have an impact on our lives daily. I pray, Lord, that we go from this place closer to you because of what we've learned about you tonight, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you be with the rest of this service. Bless it. And we pray all this, Lord, in your name. Amen.